Hey, welcome to the mine. Here you get something. Hey, if we haven't been able to meet, my name's Brian. Get to serve as the executive pastor for our church. And man, I love being here. I'm so thankful for you guys being here. It's just a special place for us. We get to go verse by verse, book by book through the Bible. Not skipping over the hard stuff, but digging into God's word. And it's been a long five weeks. Has been for me. Maybe it's been for you. We are in week six of our study in Romans as we just dig deeper into the gospel, looking at it from different angles, different arguments. And now after five weeks, we come to what might be the most important paragraph in Romans. Some say in the whole Bible. Martin Luther said this about Romans. We're in 21 through 26. He said this. It's the chief point. The very central place of the epistle and of the whole Bible. Now, that's a tall order. He says, others have said this. It's possibly the most important single paragraph that's ever been written. Not bad for a Tuesday night at Cornerstone, right? There we go. So I want you to think about this for a second while we're getting ready to read what I've been praying through, thinking through for weeks on even just an attempt to teach this to you. These are some of the most important words that have ever been written about the Christian faith. We're going to come into some big Bible words tonight as well. We're going to see at least four of them that we're going to look at. But this is why we're here, right? To dig deeper into God's Word. Paul's going to be very specific in this text around one thing. What did Christ accomplish on the cross? That's where Paul's at in his argument. We've said week over week that Paul's building this argument about the gospel. And as different points arise, we're going to get into those This is where Paul's at tonight in his argument. We're going to go on into chapter 4 and talk about faith. We're going to go on into chapter 5 and talk about how it moves from Adam to Christ. We're going to go into chapter 6 and talk about what it means, union with Christ, to be in Christ. Chapter 7 about how we wrestle with ourselves. Chapter 8 about how to walk in the Spirit. Chapter 9, 10, and 11 just get really weird. It's going to take a minute to get through those. Chapter 12, what does it look like walking out the faith? On and on and on. There's so much more to come, but tonight, Paul's brought us to what happened on the cross and what did Christ accomplish. We're going to look at that, and then I want to spend some time at the end looking at how we live in that. So again, we've said every week, Paul's going to introduce us to new topics. We want to look at those separately, just kind of building us a foundation of God's Word, like I'm stirred up about tonight's message. It's what I tell you, I may cry cross makes me cry. I can tell you that God has worked on me for the entire week last week, moving to a certain place for you guys tonight. Man, I really am praying that God does something in someone tonight. Here's where we're going. Paul's going to introduce us to Jesus. He mentioned God's son back in the introduction. He did. He mentioned Jesus Christ, our Lord, back in the introduction. But he started to build the gospel argument in chapter 1, starting in verse 18. And everything since then has been leading up to this where he introduces us to Jesus, and not just by title, not just by association, but as the solution to the problem that we've been walking through over the past few weeks, the problem of sin and righteousness. He's going to tell us why Jesus is such a big deal, and he's going to tell us why Jesus is the only way. What we're going to walk through tonight is literally what separated the church in the 1500s into two teams into the Catholics and the Protestants that you see all the way through today. This is the central issue of that separation and the central issue of our faith. He's going to talk about sacrifices and not like giving up, you know, something in your life kind of sacrifice, like I'm not going to be on social media for the rest of the day, right? You're not talking about that, but sacrifice as a death. So we need a good foundation of that from the Old Testament to understand the weight of it here. We're going to jump into that. We're going to use some big Bible words. Again, justify, redemption, atonement, propitiation. Like you don't, we don't talk about that every day. It's a word that shows up in some translations. Paul's going to use these these big Bible words. He's going to teach us or begin his argument about faith that he's going to carry on into chapter four. And then I'm going to work to try and define these in a way that's helpful for you and for me. But I'm constantly reminded about this, that God, by a spirit, through Paul, has chosen to tell you and to tell me the most important things about our Christian faith in this way, using these words. 
And it makes me stop. It makes you stop and say, man, I'm going to spend time here. I'm going to pray that God opens my ears to hear. He gives me eyes to see. He gives me a heart to hold on to this truth. Just thinking about it that way, right, that God chose these words to use, gives me a different posture towards them, right, instead of backing away, instead of backing away because maybe I don't understand them at first, it makes me lean in, and, and I hope it does you too. You ready? If you're ready, say, let's go. Let's go. We finished up the first major section of Romans last week with Paul closing out his argument. He closed out his argument, finished presenting his case. He then cross-examined all of the witnesses. He made his closing statements, and his conclusion was this, that Jews and Gentiles alike are under the power of sin. That was the conclusion. We see it in verse 9, that everyone everywhere is under the power of sin. And then in verse 20, He sets up our text here tonight. He sets it up by saying this in verse 20, therefore no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. He's saying that way won't work. But rather through the law, we become conscious of our sin. That's verse 20. So we finish out the first major section. And Paul leaves you and me, you know, either saying or feeling, right? He's leaving the reader just being overwhelmed, I don't know about you, but just being overwhelmed. And everywhere I turn, I find guilt, I find corruption, I look at my bad deeds and they're just full of anger and selfishness and rebellion. I look at my good deeds and they're just full of pride and and competitiveness and jealousy and like I'm a terrible person. Thanks so much, Paul. That's where he leaves you and me. That's how he leaves us feeling and knowing about ourselves as we move into this next section of text saying that no one's declared righteous in God's sight by works of the law, making you and me, as readers, ask this question. Then how is somebody declared righteous in God's sight, right? If it's not by the works of the law, then how? That's the question he leaves you and me that he leads us into tonight. If it's not that way, then how? Is there another way? That's everything that we've known for all of our life. All of our life, we've been keeping up the law. We've, we've been working hard. We've been doing good. We go to church. We do our devotionals. We keep going into groups. We keep registering for kids' camp. And if that isn't it, then how? Is there another way? There has to be. Because all the law can do, as Paul says here, is show you how messed up your hearts are. The law can't save us. Its purpose is to diagnose the problem, not to fix the problem. So there must be another way. That's what Paul leads us to. And he moves into verse 21, and he starts off with two of the most profound theological words you'll ever read in the New Testament, but now. But now, he's saying God has intervened. God has stepped in, and he's provided another way. Let's jump in. Verse 21, he says, but now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known. It means manifested. The imagery here is of the sun coming up out of the darkness, that it's made visible to which the law and the prophets testify. Now think about this group here that's listening to this, being read to them for the first time. They just finished hearing everything that we've talked through over the past three weeks. They haven't paused and kind of dove into it. They just read it right through. And now they're hearing Paul say, now something's happened. Something's changed that's different from what you've known before. Now there's another way apart from the law. And instead of you trying to be seen as righteous in God's sight by keeping up with it, let me tell you what God has done now. And if you look at that last part of the verse, this is where we're going to spend a little bit of time. He writes that the law and the prophets testify to this. He says, what I'm about to tell you, it isn't a new thing. He said, it's been the plan all along. The law and the prophets who have guided you throughout your history have really all along been pointing to this. The things God has provided to guide you have been pointing to this. The people God has provided to teach you have been pointing to this. Everything in the Old Testament has been pointing to this. Throughout all of history, God has been leading up to this. And there's so many ways that we see the Old Testament point to Jesus. One way you see it is through prophecy. Right? Some would say that you see over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament about Jesus. There are 55 specifically about his ministry, about his birth, his ministry, his death and resurrection, and then his role in the church. It starts as early as Genesis 3, where he talks about a coming one that's going to crush the head of the serpent. One of the most familiar is in Isaiah 53. It's so familiar that when you read it, you think you're reading the, the New Testament. 
Daniel 9 has this timeline of Christ coming before the destruction of the temple. Micah 5 points to the birth in Bethlehem. We could go on and on and on. The Old Testament is packed with prophecies about Jesus pointing to him. You see it throughout Paul is going to say that the Old Testament people were saved. He's going to argue that they were saved by faith. In chapter 4, he begins that argument, and that points to Jesus. You see it in the types of people that we see in the Old Testament. Jonah, three days, three nights. You see it in the stories of the Old Testament. If you know in Exodus, when Moses was, uh, the story of Moses where he, he lifted up the bronze serpent when it was being held up, and it said, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. So you see it in types of people. You see it in stories that point to Jesus. You see it through the law, right? The moral law that we talked about last week that points to Jesus, the righteous requirements of the law that stood there for generations saying, do, do, do. But there isn't anyone who could do good enough. There isn't anyone who could live up to God's standards until Jesus shows up and fulfills the law to stand in our place. Another way the Old Testament testifies to Jesus is in the sacrificial system that God directed his people to put in place, the people of Israel to put in place. And I want to stay on this one for a minute. This is the one I want to unpack for us. It was so beautiful as God was working through this with me and I want to stay here for a minute because here's what we're going to see in our text a few verses down. In verse 25, he says, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood. So if a key aspect of what we're going to go through tonight is Christ as a sacrifice, I want to get some foundation here. And many of us, we don't have categories for this, right? We don't have categories for a lot of things that we're going to read in Scripture, especially when you get to, like, topics of animal sacrifice, right? I mean, when I think of animals, I think my dog's got little boots and, like, designer clothes and things like that, right? We don't, we don't grasp this in our mind today. But it was common for them. It was a common thing for them in ancient Near East cultures. They would sacrifice animals to gods in order to, to get something from, him, from them, but we see a different meaning and significance wrapped around it for the people of Israel. Let me make a, a couple of simple statements real quick before we get into this, and we're gonna dig deeper. God hates sin. He hates sin because he hates what sin does to what he loves. That's you and me. And I think about it this way. I lost my mom to cancer in 2001. She died from cancer then. I watched as it wrecked her body. I watched as she went through treatments. And then I watched as she died. I hate cancer. Hate it. Took my mom. I've said this to you before. When you love someone, you hate the things that destroy them. So if you love the cancer patient, you hate the cancer that destroys them. And that's how God feels about our sin. Sin destroys his creation and the glory and righteousness that's the foundation of everything in our universe. It destroys you and it destroys me. So he hates it. He's angry towards it. He hates sin. That's why God's love and wrath go hand in hand. But here's the difference. Here's where the difference comes in. My mom didn't choose cancer for herself. That's the difference. Scripture has taught us, Scripture teaches that man, that you and me choose sin over God. Scripture teaches that it's in our nature. That's what we've been looking at over the past few weeks, that we are under the power of sin, accountable to God, and deserve the wrath of God, that it's in our sin and our selfishness that separates us from God. He doesn't want that for you and me. But we choose that for ourselves. So when thinking about the Old Testament, when thinking about the people of Israel and this sacrificial system, God knows they're as bad as everyone else, that they're under sin too, and oftentimes they choose sin over him the same way that you and I do. But he wants to be near his people, just like he wants to be with you. So he set up this alternative way of dealing with their sin and their rebellion. The people of Israel needed a system that could turn away their sin, that would pay their sin debt and allow them to stay in God's presence. And you see this as the sacrificial system that begins to be laid out in Leviticus, starting in chapter 1. There are five main types. We're just going to breeze right through these, and I'm going to settle on our point. There are five main types of sacrifices or offerings in the Old Testament. There was a burnt offering, a grain offering, and a peace offering. And these were all voluntary, 
for the people of Israel. The burnt offering was mainly just to express devotion and a commitment to God. It was also used to atone for some unintended sins. The grain offering was to say thanks to God just for how he provided. Uh, The peace offering was a sacrifice of thanksgiving and fellowship. They did that just to say thanks to God, and then they went to Chick-fil-A and had some lunch. These three were all voluntary. Then you get the two mandatory ones. The trespass offering and the sin offering. The trespass offering was given as atonement for unintentional sins that literally required me to pay back somebody that I sinned against. And then the sin offering, which is the most meaningful for us, it's what we're going to look at, was to atone for the sin of the people of Israel and to cleanse them from defilement. So that takes us to big Bible word number one. And it's that word atonement. That word atonement, hilasterion in Greek, it's in the Old Testament 103 times. And in every time, it's some translation of a very specific Hebrew word, kafar. And it originally meant this. It's really simple. It means to cover, to cover up, to cover over. And over time, it's been really technical, not just to cover anything in general, but to cover sin in particular. So in a sense, it's covering it in order to do away with it or to remove it so that the relationship between God and man can be made right. So this sin offering was meant to atone for sin, to cover it through a sacrifice, restoring the relationship with God. Now, each one of these had, had differences or different specifics with them, like it was a type of animal that you would use, um, the type of preparation that you would have, which parts of the body, like the liver or kidney, would be used in a certain way, um, which part of it um, could be sold later by the priest to make some side money. I mean, there were a lot of specifics in this. I mean, this was a whole thing. In fact, each year, God had instructed them to observe a holy day called the Day of Atonement, where a sin offering would take place for the people of Israel. And you see this in Leviticus 16 and 23. It's a very detailed description, helping the people of Israel understand that atonement for sin was to be done God's way. There's a ton of detail around this around this Day of Atonement. But I just want to mention a couple key things for us. Before going into the tabernacle, or or later on was going into the temple, the priest had to go take a shower, put on some special clothes, and he had to sacrifice a bull for a sin offering for himself and for his family. And the blood of the bull was sprinkled on the lid or the cover of the Ark of the Covenant. And that's called the mercy seat. So then the priest, after that, would bring in two goats. One was to be sacrificed because of the uncleanness and rebellion of the Israelites, whatever their sins have been, that's what the text says. And its blood was sprinkled on the cover of the Ark of the Covenant. And then the other goat, remember there were two, was used as a scapegoat. The priest placed his hands on its head, confessed over it the rebellion and sins of the people of Israel, and then sent it out with someone to release it into the wilderness. The goat carried on itself the sins of the people, which then were forgiven, get this, for another year. The lamb was held responsible for sin before God and the people walked out free for another year. Over and over again. So I want you to think about this. Try to take yourself back for a second. This is so helpful. Year after year, Like, I'm 45. So, like, for 40 years, I would go there and I would watch this over and over and over again every year. This was a part of my life. I would have seen animal sacrifice of a goat in this way every year. So, I mean, think about what that would almost condition you to understand growing up with this as a part of life. There's a few things I want you to hold on to around all this for tonight. Because remember, we're looking at how the law and the prophets, how the Old Testament testified to this new way of God's righteousness that would be revealed apart from the law. I'd say there's three key things that's pointing to Jesus. First is this. You would clearly understand that sin had to be paid for. Right? There was a debt to pay. Right? You would know. You would know God's law. You would know God's standards. You would know that you're not living up to it. You try, but you can't. And for all the sin that you piled up that year, there was a sacrifice to pay for that. Blood had to be spilled. 
Leviticus 17, verse 11, is the Old Testament central statement around a blood sacrifice, the significance of it. God speaking to Moses said this, for the life of a creature is in the blood and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. So for the Israelites, cutting an animal's throat and watching its blood drain from its body was a visceral symbol of just the devastating results of sin and selfishness. You'd be reminded of this year after year. God sees sin as so evil and so destructive that in order for for you to set things right, there must be a death, a blood shedding, in order for sins to not be counted, in order for them to be forgiven. That'd be the first thing. Just think about that. Second, you would see that even though a life had to be sacrificed for sin, you would see that it wasn't yours being sacrificed. The payment is life, but it was that of another. There was a substitute. And the idea here, the idea here is it's a wrath-absorbing substitute. The animal's life is symbolically offered as a ransom payment that would cover them. Last thing. The life that was substituted for yours had to be perfect. When you read the details in the Old Testament, the Leviticus, it talks about these sacrifices, these offerings, that there's certain requirements for what qualifies. The burnt offering had to be without blemish. The peace offering had to be without blemish. The sin offering had to be without blemish. Even the grain offering talks about the quality it must be, no leaven allowed. It's pointing as the offerer, as blemished, the animal as unblemished. It's the perfect replacing the imperfect. I thought that was beautiful, how God has pointed to Jesus in such a way since then. The whole of the Old Testament, every book points to the great sacrifice that was to come. It's Jesus, and we're going to read about that in a minute. All of those many blood sacrifices that you see throughout the Old Testament were foreshadowing the true once-for-all-time sacrifice to come so that the Israelites would never forget that without blood, there's no forgiveness. The shedding of blood was a substitutionary act Think about how deep this ran in their understanding of how to be right with God. This was the extent that God was preparing them. You need this. You need this. Year after year. Because this was an every year event. And it was just temporary. I thought of something else that was fascinating. I want to share this with you. Is that okay? Something else. When you look at Genesis chapter 3 verse 21. It's when everything falls apart. Right? This scene where Adam and Eve had just committed the first sin, they did the only thing that God told them not to do. In verse 21, it says, The Lord God made garments of sin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. That's what it says. So even in that, you see that number one, sinners need to be covered. The second thing you see is you can't cover yourself. The third thing is, I mean, they had made leaves already, but God said, no, I'm going to design the covering. The third thing is God had to provide it himself. And the fourth thing was it was obtained only by death, by sacrifice. So you literally see God initiating the first covering of sin in this way. And now, after all those years, through Jesus, you see him do it again for the last time. Man, I thought that was beautiful. I hope you do too. Let's keep going. Now that we've seen how everything from the Old Testament points to Jesus, we get to verse 22 and he tells us how the righteousness of God, it's been revealed apart from the law, how that can be had. Verse 22, he says, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. He says, there's no difference between Jew and Gentile for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In verse 24, he says, all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. So here Paul lists several things around this righteousness, right? The dictionary defines righteousness as behavior that's uh, morally justifiable or right. That's how the dictionary would define this. But we talked last week about how our tendency, when we think about righteousness or even just good behavior, you and I think about it in terms of competition and not necessarily perfection. You and I, our tendency is to look at other people around us and compare ourselves to them, but God's standard is not one of comparison, but one of perfection. 
We're not to compare ourselves to the landscape of humanity, but we're to compare ourselves to a holy God. And what you see in verse 23, it's right there, is the standard. It's God's glory. The Bible's standard of righteousness is God's own perfection. In every attribute, every attitude, every behavior, and every word, that's the standard. And that's why we have to look to Jesus. That's why God sent Christ to be the righteousness that you and I would need. Think about righteousness this way. Maybe this is helpful. It's like a report card that you get at school, right? You get your grades, and it tells you if you're qualified or not qualified to move on to the next grade. That's what a report card does. The report card is your righteousness. Or maybe think about it this way. When you apply for a job, right, you list on the resume all those things that make you qualified for the job. That's your righteousness, saying you are qualified or not qualified for the job. And if any of your employers in the room, you know that you get some resumes of people that had no business applying because they just literally weren't qualified. But let's say you do get the job. You get the job, and then every year you get a performance review, right, on whether you can keep your job or you get a promotion. Like that's your righteousness, whether you're qualified or disqualified. Do you see how that works? Every religion believes it's the same with God. Every religion all over the world, but instead of it being a vocational record, it's a moral or spiritual record. Every religion has this. Every religion has a requirement of being good enough, puts forward some list, some law of things to do or things to say. Do these things, and if you do them well enough, you'll live. But only one stands different from all the rest. So for the first time in history, the righteous record that Paul's writing about here, he says it's given and it's not earned. God's going to set somebody free tonight. Every religion says you need to develop this and offer it to, to him. But here Paul says in his gospel, God's developed this, and he offers it to you. That's the uniqueness of the Christian faith. There are only two ways to look at this issue of righteousness. It's either you behave or you believe. Those are the only two ways that you can look at this. We've already worked over the past few weeks to see that the behave path is a dead end. That me being good enough, working hard enough, is a dead end. The only way is the believe path. That we're not the ones who behave. Jesus is the one who behaves. The only one who can behave perfectly enough to qualify. So we believe in him so that it's his righteousness that we stand on. It's his resume and not my resume. It's his performance and not my performance. It's his works and not my works. It's his behavior. It's not mine. I just believe in him. So the first thing Paul says about righteousness is that it's given. That it's given through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. He says it's the same way for everyone. Republican, Democrat, young, old, rich, poor, black, white, American, not American, even Canadians. Like it's for everyone. All fall short of the glory of God. But this righteousness that is needed is given. He says it's available to all, it's offered to all, and it's sufficient for all. Everyone everywhere have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God and need Jesus. Paul writes these two things, that we've sinned and fallen short. He's using these two terms. It's almost like athletic terms. Um, Sinned is this idea of an archer's arrow falling short of the target, and then fall short is this idea of falling behind in a race. And that's why Paul says you need this righteousness that's given. It's given through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. You with me? That moves us on to the next thing. Our next big Bible word for tonight, number two, is justification. Something called justification by faith. This is what separated the church. The righteousness that we get from Jesus He says it's tied to this idea of justification. Justification means this. It means just. It means right. It's a legal declaration that happens all at once. And it carries with it this imagery of a courtroom. Justification is not a process where we become righteous. It's a declaration that you are righteous. If I get accused of a crime and I get hauled into court, and the jury decides I'm innocent of all charges, then I'm cleared all at once. I'm justified. He's not giving me a seven-step program which I can become innocent. He declares me innocent all at once, and I walk out a free man, just as if I had never sinned. It's like a judge slamming down the gavel, saying that you're acquitted 
of all charges of sin acquitted. The verdict isn't that you're not guilty, because you are guilty. We're going to see that later on. God is just and the justifier. It's not that you're not guilty. God knows that. You know that. We're going to see that. But here's the key difference in being acquitted. In our court system, you may know this, right? When you're acquitted, you can never be prosecuted again for the same crime. There's even a term for that. It's called double jeopardy. You can never be prosecuted again for the same crime. The slate is wiped clean with no comeback. So when, when the gavel of God slams down and he says you're acquitted of the charge of sin, that you're justified, it's not just your past that he covers. He covers whatever it is that you're struggling with today and he covers whatever it is that you'll struggle with in the future. That now God looks at you and he sees you as blameless, as spotless, as holy, and not because you are, but because he declares you to be. That's justification. And Paul says that we're justified freely by God's grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. And some translations say you're justified as a free gift, but to be justified is to believe by faith that Christ paid for your debt in full. So this is what it means. Justification means you're fully, freely, and forever forgiven. Now, that's good news. We can say that. We can know that. You need to know that for your life. That has profound impacts on the life of a believer. You can know that because of the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. That's what Paul gives us at the end of verse 24, and that's our big Bible word number three for tonight, redemption. All that means is to buy back. It means to release by payment or to be freed by paying a ransom. It's used nine times in the New Testament, five times by Paul itself, and we're going to see it again in chapter 8. And the basic idea is freedom gained from whatever you've been held to, from whatever it is that has been holding you bondage or captive because a payment has been made for you. So Paul says we're justified through Jesus buying us back, releasing us from something by paying a price. That's what redemption is. Paul wrote this in Colossians chapter 2. He said, And you who were dead in your trespasses, in your sins. It doesn't mean you're a bad person in your sins. It says you're dead in your sins. And the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him for having forgiven us all our trespasses. And then in verse 14, he says this, By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. He says, he set it aside and nailed it to the cross. Jesus paid your debt. He paid my debt. He paid the debt that stood against us because we can't live up to what God's law demands. The debt was nailed to the cross. He did for us what we could not do for ourselves. He hung on that cross, suffocating in his own blood, and then said it's finished. Righteousness has been purchased for all who believe. We're redeemed from being under the law, which you, to you and me means we, can, we no longer have to try to save ourselves. We no longer try to justify ourselves under the law, but have now been redeemed, bought back. And through that purchase, you're justified and given as righteousness through faith in Christ Jesus for all who believe. Redemption is the act of purchase. And the price paid for redemption was the highest price that could be paid. Let's read that verse 25 and 26. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, forbearance just means God holding back, holding back judgment that's deserved. He had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. And then verse 26, he did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. I want us to understand the language there. Beginning in verse 25, you see sacrifice of atonement. Some of your translations would say expiation. Some of them would say propitiation, these big words. You only see it four times in the New Testament. Paul ties this with the cross, ties it with the shedding of his blood, And he says, this is what you receive by faith. That word, sacrifice of atonement, means that God poured out 
on Jesus the righteous anger that he had toward us. You see this four times in the New Testament. It's a word that means God's wrath is satisfied, that his claim against you is settled. It means that with Jesus, the wrath of God was taken on himself through the shedding of his blood, that Christ bore the wrath of God for our sins and turned it away from us, reminding you and reminding me that at the center of the Christian faith is a blood-splattered cross. He was cursed so that you could be blessed. He died so that you could live. He took your place so that he could put you in his place. The wrath of God was poured out on the Son of God so that the grace of God could be poured out on you. And from that cross, he said, Father, forgive them. He said, Father, why have you forsaken me? It was in that moment the wrath of God rested upon him. And then he said, it is finished. Martin Luther said this. He said, all the prophets foresaw that on the cross, Jesus became the greatest murderer, adulterer, thief, rebel, and blasphemer there ever was. Our most merciful father sent his only son into the world and said to him, Jesus, you will become Peter the denier, You'll become Paul, the persecutor, the blasphemer, and cruel oppressor. You'll become David, the adulterer, and you'll become Adam, that sinner which did eat the apple in paradise. He became the husband who neglects or abuses his family. He became the immoral woman who wrecks someone else's marriage. He became the drug addict, the teenage girl lying to her parents, the hypocrite living a double life. He became the proud, the selfish, the apathetic. He became those things and died for them so that you and I could be innocent of them. And when I lay my hand of faith on him, my sin becomes his, and his righteousness becomes mine. That's what the cross means. All that could be accused of you before a living God, from the first time that you lied to when you lash out in anger, to all the times that you sinned, all that can be brought before God to accuse you, Jesus at his right hand would say, no, I paid for that. They're mine. Spotless, perfect, pure, holy, mine. Because in the cross of Christ, everything that made you an enemy of God was poured out on him, absorbed completely by him. There is no more wrath so that you and I are no longer under wrath but under mercy. You have no sin. I've said this to you before. You have no sin, past, present, or future, that has more power than the cross of Christ. The cross was not Jesus, just Jesus showing us God's love. It was him taking the place of our punishment. It's why we say he didn't just die for you, that he died instead of you. Paul goes on. We're going we're gonna to race to the finish here. Paul goes on to say that in his forbearance, And it's holding back, and it's holding back the judgment that's deserved that he left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. In this, we're reminded of what he said earlier around this day of atonement and the sacrificial system that we walk through that God gave the people of Israel and put in place. They were doing this year after year. Remember that. They got, their sins were covered for another year, but they had to do it year after year. It was necessary to do this over and over again. So something must have been different about that than what we see with Christ here on the cross. Because if God had totally forgiven their sins that were committed by his Old Testament people, they would be gone. Nothing nothing more would need to be done. But Paul's showing us that, in fact, God had not forgiven them. So much was left unpunished. And until he punished his son for them on the cross, it's showing God had patience and he deferred payment for those sins. The writer of Hebrews wrote this. It's in Hebrews 10. He wrote this, that it's impossible, it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Every priest stands daily at his service offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. He says all those animal sacrifices actually in themselves accomplished nothing. Animal sacrifices weren't achieving the forgiveness of sins, not ever. So so what were they doing? They were pointing to the cross Hebrews 9, 12, it wrote, Christ entered once and for all the holy places, not by means of blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. 
So the reason, right, all the bloodshedding that you see, that it's ceased now, all of it has ceased because Christ's sacrifice was so complete, so full, so decisive that it secured our eternal redemption. So if you have Christ, you have eternal forgiveness for sins. Not only does the sacrifice of Christ ex- extend forward as an eternal redemption, but it extended backward in history as a redemption for all the Old Testament saints to put their faith in God for forgiveness. I mean, think about that. The reason God was righteous to pass over their sins, to forgive their sins for the Old Testament saints and the sins that Jesus forgave during their lifetime was God was looking to the sacrifice of of Christ on the cross. So just as our sins 2,000 years later, after Christ, are covered by the blood of Christ, 2,000 years before, all the way back to Abraham, Abraham's sins were covered by the cross of Christ. And so it was with every saint in between. So what that means to me is that if God's way, if Christ's cross can cover 2,000 years before, 2,000 years after, you got to know it can cover your life. Paul finishes off in verse 26 saying this, that he did it to demonstrate his righteousness, but adds, at the present time, so as to be the just and justifier. So what does that mean? It means God renders a verdict of us being guilty and then resolves the problem for us. That's what it means. You got to have a good understanding of them both ways, right? Because if you only see God as passive, as, as never a justifier, as never just, as never a judge, or if you always see God as angry and mad at me, then it's going to distort your relationship with him. You got to have a balance on how you see him. You got to see him rightly. It's important to see him as both. I want you to think about it this way. It's as if it's a story that I read not too long ago. There was a couple who was renting a house. They signed a contract with the owner of the property to rent for a certain period of time for a certain amount of money each month. And what happened was one month they defaulted on their contract. They didn't have the money to pay the rent. They fell short on the contract. They didn't have the money, so they fell short on meeting their payment obligation. And this went on for a couple of months. So it went on for a couple of months, and the owner started the eviction process. So they all went to court. The couple did admit they had fallen short of their obligations. They'd fallen short of their contract. So in light of the law, right, what would be the just thing to do? To say you're guilty, right? So they say, well, I, we can't pay the money, but the just thing is the contract says you need to pay the money. And if you can't pay the money, then you can't live there. So you're guilty. That's the just thing to do. So the judge rendered the verdict, but then he asked everybody, just hang out and wait for a minute. And he went back to his chambers, He went back to his chambers and he got the money out of his own personal account, the total amount that they owed. He came back out to the front and he handed it to the owner saying, I'm paying their debt in full. He was just to declare them guilty and he was the justifier and he paid their debt. And in some regard, that's how we see God as just and justifier. That we're saved from God, by God, and for God. We're at the end. I want to do this. I want to read it one more time but I want to read it backwards. I'm not going to read it word for word. I just want to read it concept for concept backwards because I think it's helpful to put it all together. Here's what Paul's saying was accomplished on the cross for you and me. He said, you and I are guilty of sin. You know it. God knows it. But instead of punishing you, he chose to punish his son instead, sending Christ to the cross, crushing him. And it's with his life that he paid our debt, the debt that you and I owe for how we've sinned against God. And now, because of what he's done, we're justified before God so that when you stand before him, you, are, you do so acceptable, spotless, pure, without sin, that when God looks at us, he says, there's no sin in that man. There's no sin in that woman. It's removed and God sees you as just with the righteousness of Christ. You can't get more right than how right you are right now. You're justified by him. Your identity now is the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Your identity is now hidden in Christ. And who you are is as righteous as Jesus is. Here's the great news. In all of what we just read in this text, there's nothing about your effort. There's nothing about your might, your religious stamina, your morality, you cleaning yourself up. You've been made pure, standing blameless in front of God. That's your identity because Christ died. 
and you now live. And this is what Paul says is received by faith. I want to look at that word for just a minute as we close up. This word faith, pistis is the word, and you, this is what it means. It means to join yourself to, or it literally means to lean your weight on. Martin Lloyd-Jones said this, the man who has faith is the man who is no longer looking at himself and no longer looking to himself. He no longer looks at anything he once was. He, he does not look at what he is now. He does not look at what he hopes to be. He looks entirely to the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work, and he rests on that alone. Faith is only substantial, as substantial as where you put it. Faith didn't die on the cross. Faith didn't raise on the third day. Faith doesn't sit at the right hand of God and intercedes for you to this day. Faith is only as substantial as the object that you put it in. Belief, that word believe is a verb form for the word faith. That means putting your trust in something. Because you can believe something to be true with no personal commitment or dependence involved in it. You, you have to believe this and put your trust in this. Here's what I want to say. Hang out with me for just a minute. Here's my heart. My heart is not to get through this text and for you to hear code theology. My heart is for you to read God's word to you. To read in the Bible specifically what Christ did for you and accomplished for you. So that it's not code theology, but that it warms your heart. I can't tell you how many times as a pastor I've sat with so many that have wrestled with the sins in their life and they can't see themselves the way God does. I've sat with a young woman who lost her child by her hands. It was a very tragic situation and there was so much healing, so much trauma, so much that we had to work through because she couldn't reconcile her past with God's grace. God saved her. God rescued her. I got to baptize her. And I got to watch her walk forward, still dealing with the things in her past, but working to see herself as God does. That's what I want so much for you. To be reminded that every sin that you have had is paid for. Jesus would say, I paid for that. You don't need to pay for it anymore. This is how you know if you really understand the gospel or not, is that when you sin, do you run to God or do you run away from him? And that's what I want for you. Man, I really do pray that someone here tonight is going to be freed from seeing themselves wrongly and that they're able to see themselves rightly. You should walk out of here. Every one of us should. Fall to our knees and literally thank and praise God. Praise Jesus for what he did for you. There's no more that he could do to show you how much that he loves you. But here's what you also know. He did not just die. He rose again on a third day. That we serve a risen, living Savior who sits at the right hand of God and intercedes for you until you're brought home. That's good news. That's good news. So I don't know if this was heavy. I can tell you as I work through it, man, God really rested on my heart. I can tell you there's not another passage that I would stop and pause and go so deep on, but I wanted to do that for us. I wanted to go back and look at how meaningful it would have been for them in order to help it be so meaningful for you. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for our opportunity to sit under your word. Father, I thank you for um, just the way that we're able to do this so freely. Again, we're reminded, Father, there's so many that are unable to do this. And we never want to take it for granted, Father. I want to give you praise in your name. Here's what I want to pray for us tonight. Father, we just read through what your son did for us on the cross. And it's in that, Father, I would ask that you would rest on the people here in their heart how much you love them. What was given for them so that they know that they can sit in your presence with confidence, with assurance, and enjoy you, Father, in their days to come. And if there's someone here tonight that's just captured by their sin, 
they've been struggling for some time. Father, maybe they're conditioned that way. They've become insensitive to it. Father, I pray that in your kindness, you'd remind them that your son, your son died for that. You paid that so that they can come back to you and find you again. There's someone here that needs freedom. Father, that you would provide that freedom for you, for them. And Father, if there's someone here that is not saved and they don't know, what they heard tonight, Father, was what you gave for them to know you. I pray, Father, that you would rescue them tonight. We'll pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.